Yeah, before we get going on here. So talking about assistant coaches, from a head coach's perspective, your assistant coaches, number one, need to be loyal um, and need to be bought into the culture that you're trying to have as a head coach. If you have assistant coaches that are not bought into your system, they're not bought into the culture that you're trying to uh, have with your team, um, you are going to have a real hard time um, with, with coaching that type of team as a head coach. Your assistant coaches need to understand that, um, you know, there's going to be conversations between you and the coaches, the head coach and the assistant coaches that are not meant for the players. You're going to be talking about evaluating players. You're going to be talking about issues that players are dealing with. Um, and strategies to either help them or uh, account for those those strategies. And, and there's always a rule that kind of what happens in the office stays in the office. And any kind of disagreements that, that my assistant coaches have with something I'm doing, um, if, if at all times, I, I would really, really prefer those conversations to happen one-on-one -on -one um, because once again, it's really important for me that our culture is rock solid and that the buy-in from our coaches is rock solid. And uh, even having that conversation to me in front of players um, can show uh, a sign uh, or a lack of that type of foundation being rock solid. So you want to, you know, if there's disagreements, which there's going to be, you know, um, from a head coach's perspective, you don't want all your assistant coaches to be yes people. Um, you want them to um, provide constructive criticism and suggestions and be part of game plans and things like that. Um, and you will get a lot more buy-in from them if you do involve them in those situations. Um, but disagreements or, or um, you know, uh, situations like that that require sometimes tough conversations, those need to happen one-on-one. -on -one. And, and sometimes when coaches, assistant coaches, leak information from meetings to players, um, it can be a disaster in the locker room and can really create some dissension. Um, and so from a head coach's perspective, what I'm looking for in an assistant coach is somebody that's loyal to our culture and our program. Um, above all of that, obviously, they've got to be a great person and great with people and, um, and love helping people. But in, aside from that, the loyalty for the program, the culture, um, and then the ability to disagree um, and then have those conversations one-on-one -on -one so that when we are, are talking about ideas or strategies or about our culture with our team, we've ironed all that stuff out before we ever get in front of the, the players um, so that we are rock solid as, as a staff. Um, and so... Um, from an assistant coach's standpoint, um, well, first off, Ian, do you have any comments about, you know, kind of the coach's perspective with an assistant coach? And I can, you know, you can go ahead and throw it in the chat and I'll keep talking until you get done typing. Um, you know, kind of going into the assistant coach's perspective, because I've been an assistant coach as well. And I, and I was in a situation that was, um, and I'll explain that later, but in just a few minutes, but before I get into that, but um, being an assistant coach can sometimes be tough because you as an assistant coach may have ideas and you may have um, strategies or ways of dealing with athletes that may be different than the head coach. And you, as the assistant coach, you have to be those things that I just described that the head coach is looking for. Otherwise, you're not going to be an assistant coach for very long because when head coaches find out that, that assistant coaches are not loyal or they're saying, you know, leaking information from coaches' meetings, and um, typically they're, they're let go. Um, and so when I became an assistant coach, um, you know, I, I, one thing that, that I thought was very helpful that I, that took me a, a while to learn was that, um, and then this is the same thing that happens with our players, um, players and coaches have success doing things a certain way. 
And when they really buy into that way, um, it's hard to believe that any other way will work. And, um, and young assistant coaches, um, I think sometimes, and, and young players um, kind of have just little, only a limited perspective on their sport until they get into college and things like that. And, and um, And so sometimes you have ideas and, and you, and you want to install them and you say, man, we can do this. We can do this. We can do this. And, and, and um, it may be against what the philosophy is or the culture is of the head from the head coach's standpoint. And sometimes that can be really frustrating as an assistant coach, but when you become an assistant coach, in my opinion, unless the head coach is treating people in a way that is abusive um, or they're doing illegal things um, or unethical things. Um, an assistant coach and myself as an assistant coach, you need to be bought in for what you signed up for. And um, in regards to the culture and that team, and you need to be supportive of all of that. And so you need to be really careful um, to um, not always think that the, the way that you know how to do something is the only way to do it. Um, and, uh, that's hard to do. And so I'll give you an example of that. Uh, my first year coaching, um, as I might've mentioned before was in 1991. And I was asked to be the linebackers coach for, um, Gary Patterson, who's now the defensive coordinator at university of Texas, but he was at TCU for many years and we were really good on defense. And, um, that first year I coached, we were the number one defense in the nation and, like I said, we were really good on defense. And to me, there was no better defense, no better techniques than the exact ones that Coach Patterson taught me. And so Coach Patterson left uh, the next year and went to a professional football league that was just starting up. And we got a new defensive coordinator, and his name was Dan Hawkins, who is now the head coach at UC Davis. Uh, Dan Hawkins had different ideas. And although we had tremendous success on defense doing things a certain way, um, Dan had some different ideas. I, the, the concept of the defense was going to be basically the same, but there were different techniques and different ways of explaining things that Coach Hawkins just did it slightly different than Coach Patterson. Now, looking back, both of these coaches have been exceptionally um, successful in, in their careers and um, – Definitely are different styles of coaches, definitely different types of cultures, definitely different types of schemes, but both successful. And at that time, as I mentioned, you know, I was bought into one system and one culture, and this is how we do it. And this is this is our culture. And, and I was not a very good assistant coach, uh, I think, that year because um, you had players that had just played in that last scheme. And uh, for that, for Coach Patterson, that were bought into that as well. And um, me not being fully bought into the kind of new way we were doing things, um, I think may have poisoned some of those players a little bit to not buy in as much to uh, Coach Hawkins. And, um, you know, I was the team captain the year before. And, and, you know, and so when we would do things that were different and they didn't work, people would say, oh, man, you know, so we would have done it this way. And blah, 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 blah. And, and that can be really detrimental to a team. And I look back and, and wish I had had more perspective at that time as a young person to realize that, you know, there's so many different ways to be successful. Um, and we did have conversations behind closed doors, Coach Hawkins and myself. And, and he was the one really that explained that to me that, look, I'm not Gary Patterson, and this is not going to be Gary Patterson's defense. Um, you know, I do things a little bit different. And for you to be a good coach for me, you have to get on board. And I did, uh, you know, I, I did. And, and, uh, but I think early on, I was so, I was so bought in that I, it was just really hard. Um, and so that's something you're going to deal with as an assistant coach and, and, um, you know, being supportive to the head coach or the coordinator, or whoever your direct supervisor is, is really, really, really important. You have to understand that in most cases, that coordinator or that head coach has put in probably 10 times as many hours as you have thinking of why it's important for whatever decision it is, and that you may not have spent the time researching it or 
um, you know, like it's common for young coaches to say, hey, coach, I think this week we ought to blitz the corners. And you go, all right, that's a great idea. Okay, how are we going to cover those outside receivers? And how are we going to, you know, what are we going to do with the linebackers? And what are we going to do? And what scenario should we call this in? Is it when they're lined up a certain way? Is it third down? Is it when we're inside our own 20? And many times they'll go, well, I, I didn't think of all that. I just thought that'd be a cool play, <laughs> you know? And and you so it, you as the coordinator, as the head coach, you have to be open to those types of ideas. But then what I like to do is, is add more questions to, to make sure they've done a little bit of research and then that's just not something they're making up. Um, but I will say I did struggle with that early on and, and uh, it's something that I've tried to be better at. But it's also one of the reasons why um, – in the 22 years I've been at Santa Rosa, um, we've had, I believe we're at almost 40, 40 now uh, ex-players that have come back and coach for me. Um, so having assistant coaches now, so, you know, you can imagine the amount of time it saves for me to have uh, coaches on my staff that played for me because the coach, the coaches or the players that have played for me in the past, I've been very fortunate to have tremendous buy-in from my players. And um, they've always um, shared, uh, I think, good experiences uh, of their days at, at Santa Rosa Junior College. And so when they come back, um, you know, in terms of indoctrinating them to our team culture, our team rules, how we do things, I don't have to do that. There's a lots of conversations and behind closed door meetings that don't ever have to happen on my staff because they're not necessary. Um, you know, they believe in what we do. Um, and that is tremendously helpful and it can also be the hardest thing ever. So being an assistant coach um, is sometimes a challenge and um, you know, you, you have to understand that it's a big team, little me uh, mentality um, and uh and you have to be loyal to that, you know, and, and, and again, if, if a coach is unethical or doing something abusive or illegal, you know, that's a different story. But if it's, you know, man, this guy calls the worst plays on third, third down, you know, um, or, you know, just I think you got to be careful. Um, so I'll give you a couple of scenarios about assistant coaches and then we're going to get into our topic today. So this one is um, this was my first year coaching at uh, Santa Rosa Junior College. And I was the new guy on the staff. Um, and, and I did not really have relationships with anybody on that staff other than uh, one of my assistant coaches. And um, one of my really good players, uh, one of our team captains um, came to me at practice and he said, uh, hey coach, um, I heard that Coach Simons uh, is not going to help me out um, in get, getting recruited after I'm done playing here. And um, I said, well, who told you that? That's crazy. You know, that's craziness. And uh, he said, well, the wide receivers coach told me. And so, you know, I'm an assistant coach. I'm the new guy on the staff. The wide receivers coach and the head coach are like this, you know, and um, and so I get this information. And so, you know, take a minute and think about, you know, what would be the appropriate thing to do in that situation? You know, um, what are the options? You know, and then I'll tell you what I did. So if you think about it for a minute, um, Say, okay, well, the options are talk to that assistant coach, um, talk to the head coach, talk to the player. Um, and so I did two of the three. Uh, I talked to the player, uh, you know, the, uh, and said, well, what else did the coach tell you? And he said, well, he was, uh, he told us that the head coach was really mad at us. And because we played poorly Saturday and that if he thought that I was going to help them recruit them, they're crazy because they're not worthy of getting recruited. And so I said, well, okay, let's back up a second. here. Um, it helps the success of our program if you guys are recruited. Um, and so 
uh, you know, I explain to them how it works and sometimes coaches come in and they say things that are frustrated, but it's that kind of unwritten rule that what happens in the office stays in the office. And um, coaches say things sometimes out of frustration after a bad practice or after a guy's had a bad day, like, you know, whatever it is. I mean, even something as simple as, oh, man, we're not going to win a game this year with that guy at this position. You know, and then a coach goes out and says that to a player that could just devastate somebody. And does the coach mean that? Maybe. But does that player need to hear something like that? Absolutely not. Um, if your job is to, you know, um, if you disagree with that, that's a conversation you have with that head coach. And you say, hey, no, I don't agree with that. Um, I was not um, present when the comments were made. So, um, or I would have said something right then at the moment. Um, so I talked to the assistant coach and I talked to the player and I chose not to talk to the head coach um, in fear that uh, he would somehow take it out on the players. Um, and so I just kept it between the assistant coach, myself, and the player, and probably was a bad idea looking back um, because it was not being bought into the head coach. You know, it was, it, was a, it was a situation where I probably – I should have said something to him right away that, hey, this happened. This coach said something that was happened in the office, and it's having an impact on our players. And um, – but I didn't. And so – uh the year went on and um you know we had a good season and both those players got recruited to great universities and um after the season was over i brought it up to the head coach and i said hey you know um this happened and i chose to wait till after the season was over to tell you about it um and uh he, I, he almost fired me on the spot uh, and he did fire the other coach. Um, and so it was a, you know, it was a lesson to me, you know, that um, sometimes hard conversations um, are so necessary and we put them off sometimes because you don't want to rock the boat um, or you don't want to, uh, you know, hurt the team. But, um, you know, you're going to get put in some, some really tough situations. Sometimes players will tell, an assistant coach more than they'll tell a head coach. Um, and, uh, you know, and so you'll, you'll be closer with some of the players as an assistant coach sometimes than the head coach is. And you'll you start to get comfortable and you may be, you know, uh, tempted to repeat things that maybe you heard in the office um, or things like that. And that, that, like I said, that can really – be detrimental if they're negative things if they're good things then you know you probably share away but um <clears throat> you got to be really careful with that and so that's one of my two stories about being an assistant coach um and you know i think you guys will deal with those scenarios and for those of you that um you know my stories i'm always going to be honest and tell you what i did um i've made lots of mistakes and bad decisions in, in my 32 years of coaching and i'm not afraid to, to own up to them so i'll be honest with you guys about what i did um some of you may become a coach um when you're just out of college like i did or when you're just out of high school um and you're back there and you, you have a familiarity with some of the players and um you may even be friends with some of the players and to give you an idea um when i was coaching at sonoma state um my three roommates were players and I was a coach. And so they were all my roommates my senior year and we lived together the next year when I coached. And so they went from being just my roommates to players that I was actually coaching. My, the guy I shared a room with played the position that I coached, um, which made it really, really tough to abide by that kind of creed of assistant coaches. Um, at that time, um, you know, I was still, you know, I'd come home from coaches meetings and half the team would be at our house hanging out. And so I was like a player coach in some ways, which is a dangerous spot to be in sometimes as a coach, because you can find yourself in some uh, very precarious situations. And um, so I'm going to 
give you guys an example of one today. And, um, and when I'm done kind of setting up the story, um, again, I'm going to ask you guys to think, you know, what, what would I do in this situation? Okay. So, um, it's 1991 and I'm the first year assistant coach and there's a huge Halloween party. Ironic that it's right about Halloween right now. Um, it always makes me think of this story. So, uh, one of the players on the team who was, uh, also, um, uh, a team captain with me the year before, um, his roommates were having a huge party. He was in the same scenario. I was, he was a first year coach and he lived with a, a bunch of players in a house in Roanoke park. And I was a coach and I lived with players in Roanoke park. And so their house was having a party. Well, the party was got gigantic. And, um, this is Thursday night before we're getting ready to play Chico state for the championship first championship in school history. And, um, again, I'm not saying I, I was a saint, this was a bad decision to even allow this to happen, you know, with everything that was at stake. So not only did I not say anything about the party, I went to the party. And so the party's going and, uh, like most parties, uh, the police show up and they break up the party and, um, while some guys are leaving, they're being kind of escorted out by one of our players um, who happens to be a really big guy and he happens to be a black guy. And uh, these guys are, he's walking them out. And um, as they're walking out, there's kind of words said between these guys and another guy. And the other guy was on our team. And so the big guy that's walking these guys out turns around and he, puts his arm around the guy on our team and says, let's go back in the house. You know, uh, this is all taken care of. And by that time, a lot of police had shown up um, and uh, there was lots of people out in the street. Everybody was kind of walking to their cars and the party was breaking up. And uh, one of the police officers thought that this player on our team that was walking these guys out was fighting this other guy because he was, he put his arm around him and was saying, Hey, let's go inside the house. And he just reacted. Um, and I happened to be standing about five feet away. And so the, the police officer came up and ran up behind the guy and, and grabbed his arms and tried to detain him. And our player thought that it was these guys that he had just walked out to their car coming up behind him. And so he struggled and before he could turn around, he got hit in the head with a, a police flashlight about this long, about 10 times. And uh, it busted his head open and uh, the police were trying to wrestle him to the ground and he didn't still barely knew what was going on. Well, all of our whole team was at this party and was out in the street when this happened. And it became um, literally a riot between the police and the Sonoma State football team. Um, everybody that was at the party um, to the point where they let dogs go. They had helicopters. There was, I believe at one point, almost a hundred police officers from surrounding counties were, were at the scene and um, players were getting handcuffed and thrown in paddy wagons left and right. Um, and so here I am, I'm a first year assistant coach and I'm seeing all this. I'm trying to pull guys away that were literally fighting with police uh, it's a miracle that nobody got shot that night. Um, but by the end of the melee, 27 players on our team were arrested and taken to jail. And um, two were in the hospital um, from getting you know, beat up. And so um, you can imagine kind of some of the thoughts going through my mind as an assistant coach. Um, and, uh, like, what do I do? You know, what do I even do? Like, uh, how do I even help this situation? You know? And, and so, you know, yeah, Ian, it was a really sad story. Um, it was absolutely crazy. And this was like, um, I want to say this was like one year after the Rodney King, um, police, um, incident and, uh, the beating, um, in LA and, uh, a lot of our players were from that area. So when the police 
um, attacked the guy on our team, um, it was like, it was on. It was, the climate was like it is right now where um, people were really speaking out about um, their displeasure with the police and, and uh, it was hostile. Um, and so when that happened, it was, it really was nuts. Um, but as an assistant coach, you can imagine, um, you know, what do I do? You know, what, what do you do in that moment? Well, now that pretty much the, the, everyone that's been arrested is gone and the police now are like walking up and down the street, arresting anybody that hadn't left, uh, in full riot gear with the shields and the big sticks and, and, uh, um, you know, so I'm sitting there. Any suggestions, Ian, uh, any suggestions you want to throw in the, the chat? <laughs> what you do in that moment? So I bring this story up in, in every semester when I teach this class, and some of the suggestions are get the heck out of there and you were never there. <laughs> um, some say, you know, jump over the backyard fence and get out of there and, and uh, don't let anyone know you were ever there or um, try to break up the party before it gets too big. Um, you know, it, that is definitely would have been an option, but um, – I'd been to a lot of parties in my days in college. This was probably like one of the best part. This was not a party that even needed to be broken up. There was no, nothing happening bad. Um, it was a costume part. Everybody was in a costume. And, and anyway, it was, it was, I was in the party. I wasn't breaking the party up. Yeah, I could have done that, but um, I didn't, uh, but that would have been, you know, I doubt they would have listened to me, quite honestly, if I said, guys, we got the championship game on Thursday night. I'm not going to allow you guys to have a party. Um, I think they would have probably laughed and, and uh, that wouldn't have worked. Um, but that would have been a good way to get it started. You know, I could have notified the coaches, uh, the head coach, and that probably would have stopped it. Um, but I didn't do that. You know, I, I'd look back and say, you know, that, again, is an example of me being really young and immature and not really understanding my role as an assistant coach. Um, so uh, all of you that are watching this video, you may have different things that you would have done. Um, what I did, what I thought I needed to do because of what I saw, um, I thought I needed to do everything in my power to protect our players. And um, what I saw was not right. You know, what happened? It was, um, a situation that got blown out of proportion so fast and uh, so unnecessarily um, that I felt the, the police were in the wrong in this situation. And, um, and so, man, I did kind of the unthinkable at about one in the morning, I called the head coach at home and I said, Hey coach, we got a problem. Um, and I explained to him the situation and that I was there and, and uh, that, uh, you know, there's probably 25 plus guys in jail right now. And, um, you know, I felt like the consequences to our players and to our team at that time, um, you know, they're, they're, to me, the way I rationalized it was if there's going to be consequences, have consequences for the party. But what happened in regards to the players getting arrested and what happened with the police, I don't believe that was our players' fault. Um, nobody in, in our group of people was violent or out of control in any way until the police um, hit our guy, you know, and, and wrestled him to the ground. And the, another guy jumped in and uh, got hit also. And it was, uh, it was crazy. And that, to me – you know, in that moment, I felt like what I needed to do was tell my side of the story, even though it might have mean that I'm, you know, I get fired. Um, and, uh, you know, those guys were my friends, you know, in addition to being players for me. And so I felt in that moment, I needed to do everything I could to be there for them, despite what could happen to me. And, and so I said, guys, I'm calling Coach Walsh. And they're like, no. And I go, guys, we got to, you know, we got to tell our side of the story before they hear someone else's side of the story that might be very different. 
you know, at that time. And, and so that was what we did. And, um, so the next day they had a big conference, uh, news conference at the school and there was national news there. And, and, uh, so now kind of put yourself in the head coach's shoes. Do you allow these players to play in the game? You know, now it's Friday. The game's the next day. The school has never won a conference championship uh, in the history of the school, and you're playing for a conference championship the next day. So, Ian, would you like to throw an answer out there? Do you just, you know, do you play them or do you not play them? And for those of you out there watching, I want you to, you know, think about, you know, what what are the what are the good, bads, and ugly of this decision? Um, and, you know, what 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 are the outcomes? What you know, when you think about it, you say, okay, well, nobody plays um, because they got arrested and they got in a fight with the police. Um, you could say. Um, you know, you guys can play, but you're going to run. Uh, you know, the options are you cancel the game, um, which people have done for lesser things. You know, you say we're, we're going to forfeit the game. Our football team is, you know, in a state of affairs that's not a good situation. Um, you know, what are some factors that maybe you would even consider as the head coach in making that decision? Um, I can tell you what I think some of the factors were in our coach making the decision. Um, and then I'll tell you what the decision was, but, you know, looking at his coaching career, you know, in terms of um, this could be a moment that could define him as a coach um, because what's he going to do? Everyone's looking to see what he's going to do. National news, ESPN, you know, NBC, they're all there at Sonoma state wanting to know, you know, your coach, your players, fought the police last night, you know, what are you going to do? There's two still in jail, one's in the hospital. Um, and, um, you know, and so you look and say, okay, what would be a consideration to, to make that decision? You would say, well, um, is this a school, this might sound crazy, but is this a school that I plan to be at for a long time? Um, is, is, you know, what, what, is, what are my long-term goals as a coach? You know, and, and this decision could affect both those in positive ways and negative ways, you know, in terms of, yeah, I want to be a longtime head coach and I want to go to the highest level possible. But if I show a, a, a decision of too lenient to these players, then I'm going to be known as this type of coach. Um, but if I don't win a championship, um, I might not be known as a winner um, and which is worse, you know, in terms of getting the next job. Um, and so. Um, I think all those thoughts probably went through Coach Walsh's mind. Um, but I think in the end, um, you know, he, he, he was a player's coach and he really preached, you know, that we're going to be there for each other, especially in the worst of times. In the best of times, it's easy for people to be there for each other because it's easy. Um, but in the worst of times is really when people need everyone to be there for each other the most because it's the worst of times, you know, and, and this was a worst of times for that program. Um, and, you know, what Coach Walsh did, um, you know, he, he said he was point blank asked the same question I asked you guys, do they play or does he not play? And he said, um, right now we're still gathering facts from what happened. And but um, from the information I've been given so far that our players acted uh, in a justifiable manner based on the situation they were dealt with and they uh, responded as any team or family would to something they saw that they didn't think was right. And they're all playing. And so everybody was like, Oh my God, you know, the guys were yelling and screaming like, yeah, the game. And, and then we end up playing the next day. And, and, uh, the one player that got beat up kind of the most had about, I don't know, 15 to 20 staples in his head 
he played, had two sacks, and uh, we won the game and won the conference championship. And um, all those coaches um, used that success to catapult them to the next level. And they got jobs and moved on and moved on and moved on. Um, did they do the right thing in that moment? Um, I believe in that situation they did. Um, and, and looking back, I felt like um, I felt like I did the wrong thing by being at the party. I did the wrong thing by not trying to shut it down, you know, knowing what was coming, that we had a big game and it was Thursday night. And, you know, I could have said something to the coaches and they would have shut it down. Um, definitely, if looking back, I would have treated that differently. Um, and uh, but I think calling the coach and, and being able to be a voice for our players um, when maybe, you know, if a player calls them and says, coach, the police overreacted, we didn't do anything, you know, that's coming from a player. Um, I felt like the version of the story that needed to be told the most was had to be from somebody that was, that was reliable. And, um, and even though I was at the party where I shouldn't have been um, and all the other extenuating circumstances in the end, um, the coach thanked me and I didn't get fired. Um, matter of fact, he's one of my lifelong friends, but um, I'll always remember that. And every year as we get towards Halloween, I'm always worried about my players, um, you know, having a Halloween party. And, and we talk about this party uh, to every one of my teams um, and to every one of these classes. Um, so as a player coach, again, it's kind of circling back to where we started with this. You may be a player coach. You may be in some really, really tough situations. And, and just you have to be really cautious um, and, and understand kind of the coaching one-on-one -on -one rules are that you got to support the program and, and the coach that is your boss. And you have to uh, be bought in. And if you have disagreements or you have conversations that are tough conversations, those should more than likely happen behind closed doors um, so that um, when you do exit those doors and you're in front of your team, that you are united and that foundation is, is solid. Um, any comments on that, Ian, um, about that <laughs> crazy story? Um, I think that's still the uh, most police officers ever dispatched to any event in Sonoma County. And that was like, uh, that was 1991. But, um, interesting. You know, the second part of that story is um, about three years ago, I was at a dinner and I didn't know too many people there. I was sitting at this big table with about 20 guys. It was this huge table. And uh, I knew the guy next to me on both sides, but I didn't know the guys across from me. And it's hard not to hear a conversation, um, you know, when you're right across the table, not that you're trying to listen, but uh, so anyway, this guy right directly across from me starts telling this story of this crazy party that he had to break up in Roner Park. And, and it turned out, you talk about a small world, it turned out he literally was the police officer that hit our player in the head with the flashlight a whole bunch of times and started the whole thing. And I just sat there very quietly and listened to his version of the story. Uh, I didn't want to let him know that I was there because I didn't want this. I wanted to see what his uh, perspective was on that story. And um, well, it was very different than the perspective uh, I had on it. Uh, let's just say um, it was more about, you should have seen the size of this guy and we had to take him down and uh, we had to hit him so many times. And he, you know, uh, it was really, it was a bummer. Um, and then at some point though, when he got done telling the whole story, I introduced myself to him and I said, Hey, you know, I was about five feet from you that night when that happened and uh, his eyes got real big and, uh, and he said, really? And I said, yeah, I said, that was a, uh, quite a misunderstanding. You know, I, I was trying to be politically correct because I didn't know everybody there. And then this guy seemed like he was one of the guys um, at this event, but I just wanted to, to just, just give him enough of a heads up to say like, you know, I heard your story <laughs> and 
it's laughable, but you know, that, I guess that's your perception and I, I can't argue that. Um, so yeah, crazy small world and, and funny how things circle all the way back around. Um, and I uh, still talk to all, most of those guys that were uh, on the, the opposite end of that too. And, and when I called them and told them I had just met that, that person inadvertently at a, at a, at a dinner, um, it was, it was kind of a funny conversation, but it's just very small world. Dude. It's amazing. Some of the things that happen through sports and coaching and how many people you run into and know. So, okay. Enough of story time and assistant coaches. Okay. Um, we are, uh, moving into now, you know, some strategies of getting jobs and, um, in this week's assignment, um, what I want you guys to do is, is look for a job posting um, that involves coaching, um, whether it's a head coach or an assistant coach. And we're going to kind of go through a mock, like, hey, we're going to go get this job. And um, how do I do that? And what are some strategies for interviews? And what are some strategies for uh, your cover letter and your resume? And, you know, um, yeah, YMCA job would be perfectly okay. Um, and so what we're going to do with this assignment and then next week's lecture, we're going to kind of dive into, um, I'm going to give you what my uh, opinions and my strategies have been in getting jobs. Um, but I want to kind of start it out with you guys doing some research and, and doing some work first so that it'll make more sense when we talk about um, uh the strategies and things, because you'll have seen a job announcement and you'll have gone through that. What I will say in advance of this uh, assignment, um, you know, you guys are young, dynamic people in this class and you possess tons of skills. And sometimes you don't even know that you possess certain skills. And, and sometimes when you look at a job announcement, it can be overwhelming because it'll say qualifications or skills required, um, you know, really think hard on things that you have done and, 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 uh, and find, you know, you want to address every single thing in the job announcement, you know, when you're, when you're applying for a job, even if you don't have that exact experience, you can probably find some type of experience in your personal life or your job somewhere else where you have done that. And that could mean like, you know, let's say you're, you're applying for a job as a coach. And one of the things says, um, perform managerial duties um, and oversee players at your position or something like that. And, and maybe you've never been a coach before um, and you're just trying to get into the business and you say, well, I don't have necessarily experience with players, but at the store where I work, I'm a shift manager and, and we have to operate as a team and I have to make sure that somebody's doing the produce and somebody's doing the dairy products and somebody's doing the dry goods and, um, and I have to oversee that and when they work and when they take their breaks, because that's a skill, that's an organizational skill that, um, you know, is applicable. You can take skills that you've learned in other areas and apply them to coaching. And that's really what you do um, with some of the requirements that they're going to ask for. Um, the only one you really can't show, you know, is, the, is when they'll say, uh, you know, successful experience at this type of position, you know, in sports. Um, you, you know, you would address that, you know, in a way that, you know, although I do not have current um, uh, experience at that level or at an exact position, I have this alternative experience that I think is applicable. Um, and um, so you have to be creative when you're doing that. Um, uh, you know, your a resume or a cover letter or a job application, um, that is your first impression on somebody that you want to pay you. Um, or somebody that you want to give you a job. And um, you really, really, really want to go the extra mile to make sure your information is exactly the way you want um, to be perceived. Um, the last thing you want somebody to do is just open up a piece of paper and make a evaluation of the type of human being you are, or the type of coach you could be um, based on one piece of paper. Um, and if you give a bad impression, that's kind of what that allows somebody to do. They can make a judgment on you based on this one piece of paper um, that, um, you know, may not represent you. 
Um, if you make a good first impression, in most cases, those people are going to want to know more about you. And that gets gives you the opportunity for them uh, to get to know you as an individual and as a person. And, and, you know, because at the end of the day, people hiring coaches, especially if it's a YMCA job, and they, they we're looking for people, people that, that want to help people and enjoy that and get satisfaction out of a job where, um, you know, you're empowering others and teaching them skills. Um, and, and so you have crossover information, but make that first impression, allow somebody to dive deeper into who you are um, because that's what you want. You know, that, that you, you, it's really easy for an employer just to be looking at one page things and going, nope, 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 nope. Oh, who's this person? Well, let's call them and let's interview them. They look interesting. Um, so that paper uh, or application or online application or however you submit it these days, um, that is your first impression. Um, and it's got to be a good one. So we're going to do some work on it this week. Um, and then I'm going to go through um, some strategies um, for you guys in regards to interviews and um, uh, dealing with the cover letter and resume and, and job announcement and getting the job. Um, and because that's important. If you're interested in this class and this class inspires you to someday want to be a coach, you need to know how to get a job. Um, and we've talked about the educational requirements um, of getting jobs, but now we're talking about the nuts and bolts. Like, what do you put in your resume? What do you put in your cover letter? What, how do you respond to questions in an interview? Um, and how do you prepare for an interview? Um, so we're going to go through all those things next week, um, but I want you to do a little work on it first so you'll have some perspective and, and um, the, the lecture will make more sense. Um, any questions or final finals, Ian, um, before we sign off this week? I appreciate you being here um, and I uh, look forward to uh, conversing soon, uh, hopefully next week. Uh, we're back at home again this week, those of you that are Bear Cub Nation followers, um, and uh, we'd love to see you at the game. We've got a big one against American River at 5 o'clock. Have a great day, everybody.